for the day to come in and see what we have to offer and what we're going to be talking about in, in this hour-long session. Uh, with me, I have my colleague, Karen Guzman. Uh, Karen Guzman is going to be really serving a background function in today's conversation, in today's demonstration, helping answer a number of the questions that you all may have as we go through certain parts of the application. So what I really want to go ahead and do is what I really want to go ahead and invite everyone to do is down here inside of your GoToMeeting webinar or go to, go to webinar control panel, you have the ability to go ahead and come in here and ask a number of questions. My colleague Karen will be answering those on the fly as we go through the presentation. And periodically as those questions start to accumulate, we will take a quick stop to try and answer some of those questions live during the demonstration. You all will be remaining in a mute position uh, during this conversation, so there's not a lot of live Q&A. So I encourage everyone to go ahead and ask their questions through that online uh, question and answer forum. The other thing that I would ask each of you is just yesterday, Brett Tusshouse, the gentleman who actually runs our product management and strategy group for the Vision product, uh, hosted a webcast and a webinar called Doing More with Vision 7.4. Uh, and that will be available on our website shortly. It was actually a, a fantastic presentation. We had over 1,500 people attend it. And it was just packed with information. So if there's more that you want to get an understanding of, of what's going on in Vision, and what's the latest and greatest in 7.4, check back to our website as that webinar will be posted shortly. The other thing that I would ask is if there's a question that Karen and I can't get to during the conversation and during today's demonstration, we will be following up. And a lot of that follow-up will happen from us or from your account manager. So as this conversation ends and as this demonstration finishes, if there's any other things that you obviously need access to or you want greater answers to that you weren't able to ask during the demonstration, feel free to reach out to your account manager and those account managers obviously know where to find us. So let's get started. About two years ago, Dell Tech embarked on this journey uh, that was really spawned from our clients. And, and that journey was to go ahead and make project management significantly easier. H historically, Vision as an application had a project planning and resource management module that was fantastic if you did a lot of bigger projects. And a lot of those bigger projects uh, were the main, mainstay of your business. But for a lot of people who had projects that were smaller in duration or shorter in dollar amounts, a lot of people felt that the tool was just too cumbersome or was just too robust and too much for them to go ahead and take on an exercise of project planning and budgeting and resource management. So out of all those conversations and out of a lot of research that we then did, we understood that we needed to come back to the table and really start to address the marketplace with a best of breed approach. So we developed a solution that was called Navigator. And the intention behind Navigator was it was a lighter project planning and resource management tool. And the concept behind it was we wanted to be able to live and exist everywhere. So we wrote it in HTML, which allows it to be platform and browser agnostic. Uh, we, we give it the ability to go ahead and render itself inside of a mobile device. So when I think about a mobile device with Navigator, it's probably best suited for more of a tablet usage. I wouldn't suggest trying to do it on an iPhone or an Android phone. But you can certainly go ahead and use it and have usability around it within a Surface or, say, an iPad device. And really the concept was, let's give project management options. Because what we believe really in the core of our DNA is the professional services businesses that we serve, those people are fantastic engineers or consultants or architects or designers or master planners or CPAs or lawyers. And those people didn't t tend to go to school to be a project manager. They went to school to be a CPA or a consultant or a manager or an architect or an engineer. So the thought process behind Navigator was let's first keep it simple and let's allow these people to go ahead and gain access to project management functions they need, but give them more time and give them more uh, focus on what's A, going to make their project a success so they can understand what's going on, but give back to those functions that they're educated in, give back to those functions that they're, that they're passionate about, and not necessarily have to live and die inside of an ERP to get an understanding of how can I keep my project healthy and on track. So let's talk about Navigator here. On the left-hand side, 
you'll see a number of different icons and a number of different projects that all represent the things I have access to. So based upon who you are and what you need to see, you can go ahead and gauge the level of access your people need to see. A universal view into this information is project management view. So right now when I log in, I'm logged in as a gentleman by the name of William Berry in my sample database. What it knows and what it understands is what do I have access to as a project manager for all of those projects inside of our database. And that goes across companies. So if you live in a multi-company environment, you're seeing projects that are actually representing themselves across all your different legal entities. So as I come across here and I start toggling between some of these projects, one of the things that you'll see is every single time I click on one of those unique projects on the left-hand side, it starts to build me a very unique dashboard. So the concept is quick, fast, and easy. I can get a great understanding of what's going on inside of my project. And this was one of the things that we got from our clients. This is one of the pieces of feedback we heard from our clients for so long. Make it easy for me to understand how my project's performing so I can go ahead and take corrective action and get back to doing what I do best. And that's being an engineer, an architect, a lawyer, a CPA, what have you. Okay. So when I come over on the, on the left-hand side, you have the ability to go ahead and put all the graphics that you want so you have visual cues as to what projects you're actually being associated to and that you're then managing. But the other visual cue that's happening is the exclamation point that's either in a red circle or the exclamation point that's inside of a yellow triangle. And what this is doing is giving you some what we call some status icons or some vis visual cues into what's wrong with this project. In this one, we have no contracts on file. As I go just to the one above it, it will start to give me an understanding that estimate at completion billing is higher than the contract amount. So as you go across all these unique different status icons, it's going to give you some insight into how well are you actually running your projects and what are the things that you probably should be concerned about knowing what you know on this job. Okay. So let's just minimize this for a second and then really just look at it from a dashboard perspective. This dashboard has four parts. This is how it's delivered out of the box. You have then the capability to go ahead and add other dashboard components that we are creating for you. And, and the beauty of a lot of these things is there's not a lot of options. It's intended to stay simple. It's intended to go ahead and give the project manager the visibility he or she needs into their project and not get caught up in the data. So based upon client feedback, we've created a number of dashboards that are generated out of the box for you that all you need to go ahead and do is choose which ones you want to have on or off in that respective dashboard. The other thing we're doing is it's a real-time read back into your vision database. So while this does sit on the front end, and it is a portal into things around employee management and project management, uh, it is real-time integrated into the things that are happening within vision. So as I come over here and look at the black, the black is actually representing what I've spent so far job to date. The blue is representing what I'm going to spend. And the red line is the amount that I'm allowed to spend up to. So really the concept is if black and blue is under red, this project's doing pretty well. And we, can, we know that because we're looking at it really from a billing perspective. So the assumption is our profit and our overhead is already built into all of those numbers when we analyze this at a billing perspective. If we don't give our project managers access to billing information and maybe they're more comfortable doing everything in cost, it's really just a toggle. So now when you toggle over to cost, it gives you a little bit of a different view into it, but the understanding and the concept is, again, black is what you spent, blue is what you're going to spend, this is overhead, and this is profit. So the more you spend on this project, you can start to see your profit margins and your profit percentages getting squeezed out as we hold ourselves to that ceiling of what the client will then allow us to build them. All right? So again, the concept is really simple, stay under the red line. If you stay under the red line and you have some green in there, if you're looking at a cost, you're making money. If you're under the red line when you look at it from billing and you have black and blue is on the red, you're good. So just to the right of it, it's the labor timeline. Now this one's a lot more condensed because the project's actually going across a 16-year time frame in our sample database, but the idea is it's an S-curve or it's a, it's a three-line graph. So let me go ahead and actually click on a different one here to go ahead and see maybe an S-curve that's spelled out in maybe a shorter duration. And what you'll be able to see from this is you'll be able to go ahead and see where we are from a plan perspective. So as I go across this project's timeline and as I look out into the future, 
I can see what I'm planning to spend. I can see what I've actually spent. I can see what we've actually suggested as a baseline. And again, this red line up here is illustrating where are we when it comes to a contract amount on this job. So you have the capability to really intersect these lines over the project's timeline and track how well you're doing from a baseline, plan, actual, and estimated earned value perspective. So this is something that's in alignment with the way PSMJ goes to market with their uh, earned value management thought process. It's really the idea that you know how much you spend, you know how much you plan to spend, and we can go ahead and compare those two amounts between against what you've actually earned in the form of real revenue. So it gives you great visibility into where is this project perhaps starting to go pear shape. And this is a great example. Right here you've actually only suggested that you're going to spend or plan 74000 but the actuals are indicating something significantly more than that. So as these lines intersect and really start to deviate from one another, you can get in front of your project really getting off track. And, and we wouldn't be a brilliant ERP solution if we weren't giving people visibility back into some accounting functions, some accounting functions that we believe are best controlled by a uh, project manager. So he or she can then go ahead and see exactly where they are from an aging perspective on accounts receivable. They can go ahead and see what's still waiting to be billed on their jobs. So a great indication of whether or not a client is happy is truly how well you're doing down here. If you have a very low DSO or you have a very low amount that's unpaid and you have things that aren't getting up there in age and you're able to go ahead and generate a number of invoices and not carry labor one period to the next, that's typically a good illustration that your clients are happy and this job's going according to plan. But if you start to see some things like this, this is where you can go ahead and start raising some concerns, not only from an accounting perspective, but also from how well are we executing on this work. Okay. So outside of the dashboard, we then take it to the next level when it comes to project planning and resource management. The next thing that we can do, go ahead and do is truly get into the project itself to get an understanding of what's happening on the job. All right? So let me go ahead and toggle over to a project that I'm going to go ahead and start making some manipulation to. So there's a Benson Research Lab expansion project, and one of the things that I want to get an understanding of is what are we doing for labor? We saw this earlier. This was on the dashboard. What do our expenses look like? Because it's not really just about managing our labor oftentimes in jobs. We also have to go ahead and manage the other third-party costs or our own soft costs around the job because we're often held to a certain amount there at, as well. So we can see what have we budgeted for directs and what have we actually planned. We can also see if there's anything that was incurred, what does that actually spell out to be. So right now when it looks at reimbursables, again it's small money, but you can see we almost incurred $750 worth of expenses here. We plan to incur almost $5,400 and our contract is actually illustrating that we only have $500 on file for a contract amount. So again, hopefully the concept and what's happening here is there's visual cues back up to the project manager that should suggest we need to get an increase in our reimbursable allowance. We budgeted $500, we've already spent more than that, and we're planning to spend another $5,400. So quick, fast, and easy, we can get down to what's going on inside of our projects when it comes to managing every single pound, penny, euro, crown, whatever it is. All right. Also, some visual cues as to how you're spending that. So, you know, job to date, so far you spent 15% of the amounts that you've allocated in that budget. If I flip it over to cost, again, it tells me a different, gives me a different perspective, uh, and it really takes out the multipliers inside of uh, any of those markups we may be carrying. So he, here's what's great about it. As I come over to consultants, I also have the real-time visibility to the consultants. And again, I can toggle between the billing and the cost amount. But what I love about this one is when we really start thinking about how we execute on this project, it really comes down to what kind of labor do we want to go ahead and incur on this job, who's going to be doing it, and what kind of spend do we anticipate to happen through today up until the end of the job. So the first thing I need to do is I need to check this out. So by checking it out, it now allows me to go ahead and make modifications to my plan within the Navigator instance. What I then need to do is I need to get into the level of work breakdown structure I've budgeted people at and make some modifications. And what you'll see here is within this view, I have the capability of making modifications for everything from today moving forward. 
we're not able to go ahead and touch anything in the past. The past is the past. We can't influence that when it comes to budget. We really can only, only true that up to what's truly happening. So really, if I needed to go ahead and suggest that William Berry is going to work some hours maybe in April, I make a modification to it. And in real time, it makes the update around amounts, billing, cost, you know, whatever I'm then looking at. If I need to go ahead and take a senior consultant and maybe swap that out, I can go ahead and come up here, and then I can go ahead and add a new one on the fly. So it's going to give me some visibility into all the people perhaps in my organization, or I can look across all the organizations and find the resources that I then need. And inside of this resource view, you'll see how well people are actually being utilized from a percentage perspective. And then also down at the bottom, maybe I don't know who the named person is, but I know the type of person it is. Maybe it's a draft person. I can actually come in here, click on draft person, and then add them, and then add hours to that draft person. Okay, so maybe the draft person needs to do 90 hours in that given time frame. As soon as I make the edit and make the update, it's going to go ahead and start reflecting that at the project level as to how well this is then performing. So whether I'm doing it at the phase level, the task level, or really at the project level, updates here instantly impact all the appropriate levels of WBS to give you visibility into where you're going to end up at the end of this project. All right, so if I come over here and I hit save, I also have the ability to save the baseline and then publish this. When, when publishing it, it really is just a, a, a rewrite back into the vision database. But what it's doing for me is it's then giving me great visibility into 72 grand is my contract. I've originally budgeted almost 65 grand. I spent 3,400. I'm going to spend 51. So at completion, I'm coming right at 55,000. That's 17,000 dollars. In the, in the plus for me when compared to how much I'm actually allowed at a contract level. So it gives you the visibility and the quickness and the ease of use to get a budget in. And it's not just a simple static budget. It's a living and breathing budget that's talking about resources and the utilization around those resources as we think about what the projects look like downstream. Okay. So, it's not just about the managing of the plan either here when we think about Navigator. It's also about the invoicing components. So let me go ahead and just toggle back over to a project that has a little more detail. Now as a project manager, one of the things I can do is I can go ahead and ensure invoices are happening in the way that I need them. I can go ahead and make comments on the information. I can see how long they've been outstanding. I can actually make approvals from here. I can even comment back to my biller as to what we should be doing on some of these invoice functions or outstanding AR amounts. So what's so great about this is not only do I have the visibility into what we've historically built, I can also go ahead and start to see what is pending on my next invoice. And I can go ahead and see the detail from here. So if I want to display the invoice, I have the ability to click on it from here and actually render the invoice and see all the supporting documents. I'm not going to do that in the interest of time, but you'd have the ability to do that. You can also go ahead and see it at a high level. What kind of invoices are out there that you own are in a approval process right now? Which ones need your attention? Which ones do you need to comment on? Which ones do you need to go ahead and mark up or mark down? You're then being able to go ahead and see all that information straight from here. Okay? And then the final piece that really kind of touches on that project management element of Navigator is it's really the idea of collaboration. So our collaboration portal, if you don't already know, is uh, co-named or for us externally named Kona. And, and the idea behind Kona is when we think about the execution of work, it's not just about the financial management of that job. It's not just about the budget. It's also about how do we deliver on executables? How do we go ahead and meet certain deadlines? How do we ensure people are doing the right tasks? So this is where we can go ahead and get the ent entire collective team together to ensure that we're all marching in the same direction, that we're all beating the same drum. So this is a really conversation centric where we can come in here and we can start to see what's going on in the world of the Benson Research Lab. And what are the things that we're all talking about and the things that we have to execute on or the meetings we need to set up. So we're going to go ahead and give you visibility into everything that is contextual around the Benson project in the form of a conversation, in the form of a task, in the form of a calendar event, or in the form of a document. And the beautiful part about Kona is it resides out in Amazon Cloud. 
So there's no firewall constraint where we want to go ahead and coordinate and collaborate on projects with external team members. This is just not an internal team member collaboration tool. It's for everybody. And we all meet up in the cloud to share ideas, to share conversations, and to share documents, events, and tasks. So there's an enormous amount of flexibility and there's an enormous amount of workflow process that's hard-coded and embedded inside of Kona that then renders itself inside of our front-end project management portal uh, named Navigator. So for those who are just getting familiar with Navigator and just from getting familiar with Kona, these processes and these tools can go ahead and be game changers inside of your business because the idea is they're so accessible, they're so easy to use, they're so friendly and they're so graphically intuitive, people will gravitate to the usage of these tools because the intent and design up behind them was to make it easier. Yep. Mike, could I have you pause right there for a second? Sure. Okay. So um, a couple of questions here that I'm fielding. Could we move back and um, talk about how you enter a uh, direct a planned direct expense? Sure. And and then also after that, um, viewing it at cost. Uh, could you explain how the overhead and profit amounts are calculated? Sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Karen. So let me go back to the project that I was manipulating here, the Benson Research Expansion Project, and come back into planning. So from here, one of the things that Vision knows is it's going to, this particular budget or this particular plan, it's going to reside in one of two places. It could either, either reside here in Navigator, or it could go ahead and reside in the project planning module. So for those of you who actually license the project planning and resource planning module, um, the thing that I want to go ahead and illustrate is it's going, the data is going to exist in both places, but re, where, wherever you set up that plan, that's where the edit's going to happen. Now, you can go ahead and convert them back and forth, but really the idea is whether you're budgeting in Navigator or you're budgeting in the project planning module, they both update the same underpinning database tables in SQL. So if I'm in Navigator, I created a Navigator, it's read-only in the planning module. If I create a new planning module, it's read-only here in Navigator. And again, we do give you the capability of converting it up or down, but the, the best practice and really the, the strategy around it is you would define when is it a Navigator plan and when is it a project planning plan and really know how to go ahead and interact with that data as needed based upon what tool best fits the type of project you're then planning and budgeting for. So I'm in here. I'm in planning now. And this is, you'll see here, as I toggle between these two projects, it will actually give you that visual indication. If I come over to the Benson Research Lab, it says it's a vision plan. So this is really just read-only for me. When I go to the expansion, expansion project, it's actually giving me the function as to where I can check it out and make modifications to it. That means it's a navigator plan. So for me, what I can go ahead and do real quick, fast, and easy is I can check it out, and then I can come over to expenses or consultants. And as I come in here, and as I expand on the element of work breakdown structure, I have then the capability of adding new uh, direct costs. So it's really just a plus. I can go ahead and say, I'm going to go ahead and add a direct cost for other consultants. I select on it. I highlight it. I click Add. And then what Vision wants to do is it wants to go ahead and represent that actual cost as a cost. You can't plug it in for billing. It really looks to multiply as you set up on this job to arrive at what the billing amount is. So if I needed to go ahead and say that this is now $9,000, that's how I am then budgeting for the, uh, the direct cost on my job, whether that be a reimbursable or a direct consultant. You can even take it to the next level and say, well, I know who's actually owning that direct cost. It's H.J. Carl Engineers. So you have the ability to then associate that direct cost to a very unique vendor you know you're going to do the cost incurring with. Okay. Uh, the multipliers, I think that was the other question, right? So when you actually come in here, let me go ahead and save this. When you actually come into the project and you create a brand new plan, I don't believe I have one, but at the time of creation, um, you'll then have the ability to go ahead and see the options. So I don't have the, the visibility to that right now because all of these are actually existing plans. But at the time of creation, um, you then would be prompted with, how do we arrive at overhead? 
how do we arrive at billing markups for labor consultant expense? Those are all free form fields that you actually create at the time of creating a navigator plan. Okay. Okay. Yep. And then uh, one more. Uh, does this integrate with the actual project bud budgets inside Core Vision? Inside Core Vision. So if, if we're talking about the project budget worksheet, where you're historically doing that with labor codes and things of that nature, no. This is really a separate process. So if you're doing your budgets in the core function, and, and let me go ahead and just illustrate where that's actually coming from so everyone knows uh, exactly what I'm talking about. If you're doing your budgeting here in the accounting menu inside of budgeting and you're doing project budgeting here, there's no correlation between what you do there and in Navigator. Okay? All right. Okay. Um, Anything else, Karen? No, we're good. Thank you. All right, perfect. So let's then talk about um, how this tool, while exclusively made for a lot of project managers, is really starting to be the catalyst as to where our most of Vision is going to reside in the future. So you know, over a time period, Dell Tech Vision is slowly going to evolve into an HTML5 uh, application. So this is really the, the inroads into making more of that application more graphically friendly, more browser and platform agnostic. And, and, and to that testament or to that statement, we're actually coming out with another tab come this June, which will then represent uh, CRM information. So the idea is while Navigator today is a very great and very powerful project management tool, it's not intended just for project managers. As you come up to the Navigator menu here, you can actually toggle between project management and an employee and have the capability of then doing your timesheet from here or also then doing your expense report. So the, the idea behind expense reports is we'll honor the electronic receipt attachments here. We'll go ahead and do that direct lookup into all your categories. We'll even bring in exchange rates if you need to worry about exchange rates. So the functionality that then exists inside of your, um, your core expense and timesheeting process, a lot of that functionality is then embedded here inside of Navigator. And I say a lot. Um, because if you're utilizing the credit card reconciliation process for, credit, uh, for expense today, that's not yet in Navigator. Um, and approvals are coming uh, in June, this coming June as well. So it's not everything, but it is for, for a lot of the, the functional people inside of your day-to-day -day operations of your business, they will be able to go ahead and do the things they need from expense and time within the Navigator front end if wanted. All right, so now let's talk about the other side of it. So we talked about how we created this about two years ago, really driven on client feedback, really based upon the idea that when you think about project management, unfortunately it's not one size fits all. It's really a function that people need to have options around. So this was the option and this was the thing that we then generated for uh, the client community that was demanding something that was simpler, some demanding something that was easier and a little more intuitive. So having said that, not to call my other child ugly, but having said that, we still have the project planning module that we still see a number of our clients using very successfully when they have projects that are a little longer in their duration, or maybe a little more complex when it comes to a work breakdown structure perspective. So let me go ahead and just toggle over to vision real quick, and then get into a project plan. So 7.4 introduced a piece of functionality that I've been begging for for probably the last 10 years. Uh, we had it back in Vision 4.0, for those of you who might have been around back in the 4.0 days, but it's now something brand new in 7.4. And it's the idea that we then are able to go ahead and schedule these projects with the concept of a critical path or what some people will call task dependencies. All right. So this is brand new functionality, just cut in 7.4. Um, and what I love about this tool is it was designed by someone who was a power user in a former life at HOK. Uh, so Don Dianti, who sits with us on our uh, product management team, she was she and the developer Lou Vu, who has been instrumental in resource planning and project planning since its inception, really came up with this based upon their experience with the tool over the last 10 years, and, and Don's experience in the field actually running 
project planning inside of a big architecture firm uh, prior to having task dependencies. And this was just something that we needed to make happen inside of the application. But before we get into all this slick functionality, let's baseline what everybody knows or what everybody should know when looking at the resource planning and project planning module. So it exists here. It's a standalone module. With that standalone module, you have the ability to go ahead and create what we're doing now, a project plan. And then by virtue of doing those project plans or by virtue of doing navigator plans, all that information feeds into a really slick and comprehensive resource management tool. So to start off, what I'd like to tell everybody with, when it comes to project planning is if you run Vision CRM and you run Vision Core, for, so for all your revenue producing projects, project planning is the great place of intersect for those two things. If you need to go ahead and create a budget for something you're about to win but it's still in opportunity stage or it's still in that pre-award stage, you can do it here within planning. If you need to go ahead and schedule for a project that you've won and you know how the resources are going to be spread out over the next you know, 12 months of this project's timeline, you can do that here in project planning. And by being able to do project plans for both pre-award and post-award, it gives us an enormous amount of visibility into how we look at our backlog. We can now combine soft backlog and hard backlog in the same report by virtue of creating project plans on them. And the thing that I have suggested for a number of years to any client of mine who's ever deployed this is use the probability to help determine whether or not this project is real and revenue producing or something that's soon to be real. So by using this different probability value, it drives a whole number of different le level of reporting and then it gives you a lot of visibility on that single report between what is backlog that is soft, what is backlog that is hard, so you can get a true picture of what the business looks like when we think three, six, and 12 months out into the future. The other thing is this is a fantastic tool to write up what you think the cost and the billing and the revenue is going to be. So a lot of people use this as a, a worksheet to build up, you know, maybe from the bottom up or, or maybe from the top down what the fee needs to be and what we think we're going to be able to arrive at for revenue and billing amounts. And what I love about this is as an individual user who's making plans, he or she can go ahead and choose when this data actually becomes available for the rest of the business to look at it. So by checking and unchecking these two boxes, you get to determine when does this plan that you just created influence the rest of the business. So if you want to run a scenario A versus a scenario B versus a scenario worst case, you write up three different plans, and you get to choose which one that influences data, the database. The other two, maybe no one else ever sees. Because again, it was just you mocking something up to see what is the best or worst case scenario in a given project's timeline. It also is then integrated to everything we do from a cost and billing perspective. So much like Navigator, you are then telling the system on this unique budget or on this unique plan, how do I then go ahead and influence cost and billing amounts? So on a project-by-project -project basis, on a plan-by-plan -plan basis, you can go ahead and have very unique billing structures and rate structures and cost rate structures that's tied back to the client you're then executing that work for. So you can get very specific as to how then costs or billings are then being scheduled. Let's, let's jump back to the schedule in a little bit. But here inside of labor is when you're then taking this project, you're breaking it down into all the elements of work breakdown structure that you then need or that you then want to support. And then you're getting an enormous amount of visibility into what you planned, what you've already incurred, what you expect to incur, what that's going to look like when you're all done at the end of the job, and whether you're looking at it from an hours perspective, a billing perspective, a cost perspective, all that visibility is available to you through a simple drop-down. So if you're a person who needs to go ahead and see everything at bill value and you don't ever want to see anything at cost, it's really just a series of coming in here, checking and unchecking the boxes you want or need to get the visibility back into that project duration in one simple screen. What you're also able to go ahead and do here is break down the level of task dependent, uh, break down the level of work breakdown structure, whatever you need, and then define both named and generic resources across that project's duration. What's also great is if you know that civil engineer is now all of a sudden going to be Grace Cohen, you have the ability to slot in Grace Cohen and then do a simple right click as to where you can then see what does Grace Cohen's utilization look like when we look out into the future. So we can now go ahead and see how long she was actually budgeted for on this given job 
and I can start to look out into the future to see where else that she might have resource constraints as I think about her working on this job through the end of 2015. So there's an enormous amount of visibility into the project at the most micro level, but obviously it rolls up to the highest level or the macro level as well. Okay? So again, you define what this needs to look like. On the right-hand side, this is where you're then getting visibility into what's actually happening on this project. So every single project, you will have its own unique calendar. So every job is then has what we call an accordion calendar. So you define if this project's going to go ahead and be three months long, well, maybe you look at it inside of the concept of a week or a day. If this project's going to be five years long, maybe you want to go ahead and look at it in the concept of months or quarters. But however you want to look at it, you have the ability to go ahead and spread out your timeline in a variety of different ways. In this example, I set all the historical years, 2013 and 14, but it's all rolled us up in one single year. But everything we're doing in 2015, I need broken out in a more monthly format because that's the way I budget. And then everything for 2016, let's again look back at those in a yearly format. So not until I get to 2016 am I going to worry about breaking that information down into a more granular view. You define that on a plan-by-plan -plan basis. The other thing is, when you create a new plan, you're creating off of something that already exists. Create it off of an existing opportunity or an existing project. Take it off of a plan that already exists. So what happens is when a lot of people come up to new and they say, I want to select a plan to copy, you're going to go ahead and say, well, you know what? I'm really copying it from all the templates I've pre-designed. So you can have a number of different templates that architect the way you go to market when you budget your projects. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time you create a new one. So there's a number of different processes and a number of different functions that are in place to ensure that this is a pretty easy step by step process to get a budget set up, whether it needs to be super comprehensive here in project planning or very simple in its structure, like you might want to see in Navigator. Let me just take a quick pause there, see if there's any questions, Karen. Uh, no, we're okay. I've been able to just handle them on this side, so we're good for now. You're a genius. Thank you, Karen. All right, mm -hmm. so this is about your labor, right? So there's a number of other things that we're going to do around your labor. So one of the things that I skipped over on purpose on the general tab was really the idea of how do we arrive at a percent complete. So there's two methodologies we see happening a lot inside of professional services. The first methodology, and what I feel is the most common, is when we think about overall percent completed on a job, a lot of people refer to the internal gut checking mechanism of the project manager. He or she knows where they are in a project, so he or she can then go ahead and illustrate, maybe back to accounting and back to finance or revenue recognition, where they are from a percent complete. But if you don't want to do that and you really want the plan to drive it, you can go ahead and use any of our percent complete formulas we offer to you. And really the idea is we know what you've incurred so far. Based upon an updated plan, we also know where you're going to incur. So by having those two different philosophies represented inside of a plan, we can then back into where you really are from a percent complete. And all that information is then going to be illustrated out here back in the labor tab or maybe even inside of the expense and consultant tab as you do those calculations. Right now, my vision database knows up through 630, 2015 is where I've incurred job to date, actuals. Anything beyond 630, 2015 is going to start impacting the future, my ETC and my EAC amounts. So when I need to go ahead and back into where we truly are from an overall percent complete, we know what is the guideline as to how we cut certain data values off so we arrive at the most appropriate percentage. We can also come in here and make some certain modifications. So right now we know that Grace Cohen is going to be working 45 hours, and those 45 hours have been spread across the timeline we've then earmarked it to. But if those 45 hours actually turns into 90 hours, it knows how to do the appropriate spread. Based upon how we originally spread her, it then goes ahead and just doubles that up and spreads it appropriately. If I need to come in here and say, you know what, I really need to go ahead and add something else, maybe a new additional service. It's as simple as coming in here, clicking an insert. And when I go ahead and do that insert, I can go ahead and either insert a new resource. Maybe I want that resource to be a generic resource. Or I can come up here and actually hit new row. And what that new row is going to do is allow me to go ahead and say there's an additional service. 
and I need to go ahead and then build out this additional service and then map it back into the element of work breakdown structure it refers to on my project WBS. So it's a really comprehensive tool that can get very granular if you need it to be. But the idea is this doesn't have to look this complex. It doesn't have to be this cumbersome. It can go ahead and be a simple project with phases. It could be a simple project with tasks. Whatever your template needs it to be defined as, you can make it that. What we also understand is some people might have the, the, the discipline or some people might actually have the governance around, you don't get a job member inside of our business until you actually create a budget. And I don't care if that budget is one line or 50 lines, I need to know what is this project worth so we can go ahead and start tracking it inside a pipeline and get an understanding of what backlog looks like and all those great things that make an accounting function as a whistle. So by doing that, if you were to set up a plan first, you can actually come into actions and create a project from a plan. So if you truly then needed to go ahead and create this and write it back into the project info center and create the WBS elements, we could do a direct read right off of the plan to do so. And, and a lot of folks have a requirement to then share their progress on a job with a client uh, inside of Microsoft Project. So we'll do an import and export right into Microsoft Project straight from this tool as well. So again, we said this when we came to Navigator, it's not just about managing your labor. You're often held responsible for expenses and maybe anywhere up to 50% of your fee through consultants. So here's the facility where you can then go ahead and manage all your expenses. And again, you can get very granular as to how detailed you want those expense classifications to be caught. And same thing with consultants. Similar to how we saw it inside of Navigator, we can get very granular as to who is the other consultant, well, it's Petrochem, and how much we actually planning to have from a cost perspective from them. So what I love about this tool is if any of you have then used the consultant accrual function in Vision, this is the process that can go ahead and streamline that consultant accrual process. So right now, we know that we've incurred job to date 1,500. Let's go ahead and say that we know Petrochem is 100% complete. And sorry, I'm actually using a percent complete that is uh, calculated, not user entered. But let's just go ahead and say that I updated that to be 100% complete. And what's, what's so great about it is what the system will then do from a uh, consultant accrual perspective is it will know you incurred 1,500. It will know that you should have incurred the full 4,500 because you're 100% complete. The consultant accrual process will go ahead and make an entry for three grand to ensure that you're not understating cost or billing or revenue on that job. You really have incurred and perhaps even billed for the full amount of these guys, even though you haven't incurred their full amount of cost. So this is another function that, again, while is a project planning function, does lend its roots into other accounting functions such as appropriate revenue recognition and consultant accrual. The cost, the cost analysis tab here is just that. It gives you some great visibility around some KPIs when we look at this project at a cost perspective as to how well we've done from a multiplier perspective, plan profit, where we are for actual profit, what we are have done from a percent expended or percent complete. So it's just a lot of nice good statistics and a lot of KPIs around based upon how this project has performed so far and based upon how you are suggesting this project will perform in the future, this is where it looks like it's going to be when it comes to profit versus the planned profit. This is where you are from a percent complete versus what you've actually spent on the job. So a lot of great visibility. And then the same idea only on a billing perspective uh, is then being presented here on the billing analysis. I also love this summary tab. This summary tab gives you the run rate as to what's going on in this job when we start looking at all the things that you originally budgeted for. So we are allowing you, you to store a baseline on all these plans. And really, the concept of the baseline is this is the first pass of what the budget looks like. Uh, it might be what we negotiated as or what we struck the deal as originally or what marketing thought it was when we first won the job. So that's what our first pass at it is. And then plans, well, that's reality. That's what's happening today. Job to date is what we've incurred so far. Estimate to complete is really what we believe is going to happen from today to the end of the job. And at completion is the whole entire amount. And then we just do some simple math. This project's actually $129,000 over uh, the planned amount. 
So it gives you some visibility that, you know, right now it's telling you it's 129 grand over. Maybe you still have six months left in this job. So hopefully the visual cue is saying, do something about it. Ask for additional services. Change up your resource mix. You know, try and find a way that we can work a little more efficiently. Something to help uh, ward off that $129,000 loss you think you're going to be taking on this job. All right. So again, I think a couple more questions might have come in. I think I saw the hand raise. Uh, let me go ahead and, and pause for a second and, and see if there's any questions, Karen. Yep. So I can I can give you a couple. So um, since we talked about the pro, uh, the budget within Navigator is separate from project budgeting, can you change your progress reports to pull from the Navigator budget? Yes. So that would then be an option once you've deployed and installed Navigator. Uh, when you go ahead and say where your budget source is, you'll then have the option to go ahead and pull it from Navigator. Okay. Great. When we set up the project with WBS, do they roll over, roll over to either the planning setup or Navigator, or do we enter them twice? Great question. And it's going to take some explaining to get to that one. So <laughs> when we create a plan, I'm sorry, when we create a project inside of the Project Info Center, and we push that data into Navigator for Navigator plan, we instantly build out the work breakdown structure automatically for you. And any changes that you make to that work breakdown structure going forward will automatically update into Navigator. When you create a plan inside of the planning module off of a project, it automatically maps in all of those elements of work breakdown structure into the plan as well. But anything that you then change moving forward in that project's WBS then also needs to be added to the plan. So Navigator is a bi-directional look all the time to make sure that what the Navigator matches project work breakdown structure. With the planning module, it's really just a one-time push. So if you create a new element of WBS on the job record in Info Center, you then need to modify it and add it to the uh, project plan inside of the planning module. Anything else, Karen? Okay. Yeah, so this is kind of twofold. They're looking for um, a reporting reporting functionality that, that shows kind of like the labor tab. So a report that shows a view like the labor tab. Um, we yep. talked about exporting to MS Project, but um, would you give any advice on PMs are taking screenshots of possibly the labor tab just to get a view like that? Any things you would suggest? Um, pass. I'm, I'm thinking there's a number of different reports that we could get to, but I don't know if they'd be as comprehensive as what you'd see in the labor tab. Uh, I would have to we I would have to mess around with the project planning reports to see if there's something that we could flush out. Uh, I'm not 100% prepared to go ahead and start digging around reports to do that, but let's take that as a follow-up item. Yep. Sure. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a new piece of functionality in 7.4 that we're super excited about. And, and it's something that I'm sure all of you need, and it's really the idea of I need to go ahead and take this project and understand that when the first piece of the project moves, it impacts everything else. So that's what we're actually illustrating here. And it's, it's a pretty comprehensive tool where you can start to see earlier on in my project, a lot of these things are contingu uh, contingent upon the other one finishing. So code analysis. Once code analysis is done, we're going to jump into programming. And site analysis, as the, uh, as the successor, can't start until the predecessor is actually finished. So you have the ability to really come in here and start talking about, well, how does this project actually look? So in preparation of this demonstration, I was mocking it up to go ahead and show what you know a typical project approach would look like when we think about critical path and task dependency. But I stopped right here. Because what I want to share with you is the ability and how user-friendly this is. I don't think preliminary construction estimate really needs to go ahead and span seven years. It seems like that's a little bit long. So what I really want to do is I want to take this and I want to shrink it to something that sounds a little more reasonable. So as I take this and I shrink it, what's going to happen is the dates are going to change inside of the plan. And it's automatically going to start updating everywhere it's then appropriate. I could then take this and drag and drop it and move it however I then want. 
or I could go ahead and start uh, making a contingent upon something. So I'm going to drag and drop it a little bit more down here. And then sooner or later, I want it to go ahead and tack on to the end of the design. So what I can then go ahead and do is take it, drag and drop it over to the design element, and let it go. And what that will do is it will then make it contingent upon documentation being done before preliminary construction finishes. And what's great about this is you can do a right click here, and you can actually edit the dependency. And it actually gives you the ability to go ahead and look at this four different ways as to how that path dependency actually works. It can be a finish to start. So in that example, you're not going to go ahead and start on the preliminary construction estimate until documentation ends. And maybe you put some lag in there, or maybe you put some lead in there. You know, so maybe you can go ahead and say, well, you know what? It's going to start 30 days after. Or it's going to start 30 days before it ends. So a lot of people who do a lot of design build work or what a lot of people would term as maybe a hypertrack project, you know, you're halfway through schematic design when you are start starting to design development. So you can start to build in all those lags and leads into your different components of your job to ensure that they do flush out in some kind of critical path, path, critical path process. The other relationships that we honor is start to start. So I can't start the next one until the other one starts, or finish the finish. I can't finish the other one until the other one finishes. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can go ahead and interact with these relationships that then make and build a dependency uh, where appropriate. So it's really just about what is the relationship the predecessor has to the successor, and you, know, you can go ahead and start to toggle between these. This is the most common, finish the start. And by having a little lag or lead in those finish to start time frames, my suspicion is all these other functions aren't used all that widely. But again, we give you some options so you can go ahead and have very unique relationships as to how certain things play out when a project timeline shifts and when a, um, when a critical path needs to move across the entire duration of that job. So again, as I come over here to the right-hand side, if I wanted to take this and actually shrink it up a little bit, I can go ahead and do so. And it now knows that the entire project duration is shrinking up because that is my farthest outlier at this point. Obviously, I'm going to have to come in here and then change all the other pieces beneath it. But the idea is the task dependency function is now embedded and will go ahead and automatically update all of the resources when these things move. It will update all of the plan dates when these things move. And you'll see that here as I go ahead and again take any one of these elements and start moving it across the time frame. Those are updating here. If I wanted to, I could even come in and say, you know what, I want to be very specific. It actually starts at 12.6. I can come here and key in 12.6 and the Gantt chart will then fall out into the part of the calendar where it's then represented 12.6.2013. So we are super excited about this and we think it's going to really be a great game changer for the amount of adoption that's happening around project management inside of Dell Tech Vision. So I see that I have seven minutes left. I couldn't have planned it any better. Um, let's go ahead and see if there are any other questions that need answering. Um, just one. Uh, when you talked about the scheduling here, schedule and labor tabs uh, update each other based on edits to the schedule or work plan. So just showing that those two are in sync. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So this is updating this. Absolutely. Yep. And what happens is oftentimes if I need to, if I have something, if I have an element of work breakdown structure that is going outside of my dates that are stored at the project level, it will go ahead and actually prompt me a warning that says you need to go ahead and plan what I think they call plan collapse dates, which is basically now understanding that what you had originally set up as the timeline. Uh, you now have elements of work breakdown structure that are going outside of that timeline. You need to go ahead and collapse it or expand it. So the idea is, is the work breakdown structure element correct or is the plan value called correct? It's really going to prompt you with something to ensure that they're in lockstep and that there's no inconsistencies with what's here on the schedule tab and what's then also then being presented here on the labor tab. Okay. Other questions, Karen? Uh, nope, looks like we're good, Mike. All right, folks. So again, as questions come up or you step back and you want to go ahead and regurgitate some of this information to some of your folks inside of your, uh, 
project management camps inside of your respective firms. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to your account manager, or you can actually ping us through our website. There's a number of uh, inside sales representatives that are always available to go ahead and answer any inquiries that come in through our website if you don't know your account manager. The other thing I would urge you to do, again, like I said in the beginning, is that webinar that Brett Tushausen created just yesterday on what's new and exciting in 7.4, keep checking our website. That's going to be out there shortly, and you'll get a lot of good information as to why 7.4 is such a powerful upgrade for each one of your respective firms. So I appreciate your time today. Um, this is a format there where we're going to be running in another three weeks. So this format, along with um, a vision performance management and a CRM webinar, those are going to be ongoing for the next six months through June. So if there are other functional areas that you want to gain interest into, uh, and there's other people that you want to bring to these conversations, check our website. There's a fully scheduled uh, set of events out there for you to attend in the future. So appreciate everybody joining today. Take care.